honor the ideals of fatherhood. And of course, um, these ideals are, are biblical as we look to the Lord. And, and even though, fathers, we would be the first to say that we haven't been perfect, uh, it's a wonderful blessing to have an example in the Bible, a heavenly father who is perfect and that we can trust and he has been faithful and uh, demands that we also be faithful in the life that we live. We thank the Lord for the wisdom that our Heavenly Father provides each and every day, and, and uh, also we are grateful for the wisdom of a godly Father who directs us in the things of the Lord and uh, teaches us the pathway of the Lord. A godly Father and His wisdom and counsel should not be disregarded. Uh, it should be looked upon and followed. And there's joy and happiness in a son and a daughter who follows the example and wisdom of a godly father. Now, of course, we know that fathers, dads, are known for their dad jokes. And uh, these jokes are terrible, uh, you know, but they are a part of fatherhood. Dads love to tell them. And uh, this is just some wisdom that some fathers shared throughout their years. They said, listen, I wouldn't buy anything with Velcro. It's a total ripoff. It's terrible. I had a dream about a muffler last night. I woke up exhausted. <laughs> Someone said, you can tell it's almost Father's Day. The kids suddenly want to stop at all the garage sales. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to a dad who was smart enough to teach his kid how to mow the lawn so that he wouldn't have to do it. That's a smart dad right there. One dad said, I gave all my dead batteries away today, free of charge. Free of charge. Oh, that's horrible. One son said, Dad, I'm hungry. You know the classic, I'm hungry, Dad. And the dad said, hello, hungry, I'm Dad. And he said, Dad, I'm serious. And the dad said, I thought you were hungry. <laughs> well, so confused. Let's notice our text this morning. Luke chapter 15 and verse number 11. It's a familiar passage of Scripture and a familiar story uh, that we'll look at. The Bible says in verse 11, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, and he said a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divideth unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he went and sent him into the fields, in his fields, to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and fell and, uh, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead 
and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of his servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him, and he answered, uh, and, and he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Never transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid, and that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, and has killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should Make merry and be glad, for thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you would help us this morning as we look at your word and give us principle for our life to help us and to direct us. I pray, Lord, if there is a Christian who is strayed from you, I pray that they would come home. I pray, Lord, that they would return to the Father's house. I pray, Lord, that you would do a work of grace in our heart and in our life and help us, Lord, as earthly fathers to be compassionate and loving and to follow the example that you so clearly have given to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When you look at this parable in, in the, Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, this parable is actually a part of a larger series. And you really can't separate them. It all comes together in the very first verse of the Gospel of Luke in the 15th chapter. The Bible says, Then drew near unto them all the publicans and sinners to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And so Jesus illustrates to the Pharisees and his disciples really the heart of the Father. And he gives to them three stories. The first story is the story of a lost sheep. The second story is the story of a lost coin. And then he concludes this wonderful sermon with the story of a lost son. Now, don't miss this. The application is the same for each story. And that is the celebration when the lost is found. You see, God rejoices when the lost come home. God's heart is not a heart of condemnation. The heart of God is a heart of compassion. And this is so wonderfully illustrated in the Lord Jesus' story. Now, as we highlight these thoughts of the Lord caring for the lost, the Lord seeking for the lost and the Lord's desire for his people, his children to come home. It's also important for us as godly fathers that we follow the Lord in these things, that we are a compassionate people, that we are a caring and loving people. And so in this parable, the Lord really gives us, I think, wonderful principles for fatherhood. And, and let's be honest, this is not just for fathers, though it is Father's Day and the message is a Father's Day message. The reality is this, this is for, for all of us this morning. Because God reveals to us His heart 
I'm glad that God is a persistent God, that God is a compassionate God, that, that God is a God who, who patiently waits for, for His children to come home when we stray for him, from Him. And so I want us to notice, if we could, this passage of Scripture, and let's break it down and look at the principles that God has for us. Number one, if you're taking notes with me, would you write down the Son's Rebellion? The son's rebellion. Now, in this passage of Scripture, we find a son who decides to leave his father's house. Now, the illustration of this passage of Scripture is not a Christian who decides he doesn't want to be a Christian anymore and he loses his salvation. That's not what the Bible is teaching. In fact, he's eating with publicans and sinners, and the thrust of the message is actually that Jesus receives sinners and that we can come to Him for salvation. And we use this application to not only speak of salvation, but also the rebellion in a Christian's life, that they would stray away from the Lord, and that God's heart is always for them to come back. And so the Bible says that a son decides one day that he's going to leave his father's house, and he's going to live it up in the world. The Bible teaches us that he comes to his father one day and he asks for his portion of the inheritance. Now, the Jewish law allotted one half as much to the younger son as to the elder. And that is to say that he would receive one third of the estate or one third of the inheritance. But but this occasion or this event would only take place at the death of the father. And so the reality is the father did not have to give in to the request of the son, but the Bible says that the father agrees to this request and he gives the younger son his share. You know, sometimes the hardest lessons that we learn in our life is through experience. You know, someone said, if you're going to be old and wise, then you're probably going to have to be young and foolish. And we see this young man was young and foolish. He took his portion of the inheritance, and the Bible says not many days after, the young son gathered his things, and he took a far journey. The Bible says he leaves his home. He leaves the comfort of his father's things, and he goes into the world. We see, first of all, in our Scripture here this morning, that he wasted. He wasted. Now, it's heartbreaking to a father and a mother when their child wastes their life and their potential. I mean, in verse 13, the Bible says that here this young man, he gathers his things, he goes to a far country, and the Bible says he wasted his substance. You know, God is the author of abundance, but God is not the author of waste. You know, there's a wonderful story in John chapter 6. You know the story well. Jesus feeds over 5,000 people. He keeps on breaking bread, and there's enough for everyone to, to eat. God supplies the need. And then the Bible says, Jesus tells his disciples to go out and to gather the leftovers. Now you would think a God who can take something small and make something bountiful from it wouldn't really care how many baskets remained. And yet the Bible says in John chapter 6, verse 12, and when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. You see, God is not the author of waste. God doesn't want us to waste. And our Heavenly Father doesn't want us as His children to waste our lives. He doesn't want us to waste our abilities. He he doesn't want us to waste our talents. I believe it breaks the heart of God 
when we waste the substance that God has provided for us. I want to encourage you this morning not to waste a Christian home. Not to waste a Bible-preaching church. Not to waste the Word of God that, that is in your hand. Not to waste godly friends and a, a godly family. But I think even more sad than wasting substance is that if we were honest this morning, we would be also guilty of wasting time. The Bible says in, re, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The word redeem means to buy back, to make good use of. Make good use of your time, the Bible says. Someone said, the clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time you own. Live, love, toil with a will. Place no faith in tomorrow, for the clock may then be still. God wants us to hold the opportunity that we have before us. Now, how did this young man waste his life? Well, the Bible says he wasted his life in riotous living. Listen, friend, when you live for yourself and you live for the world, you are wasting your life. And he wasted his life in riotous living. The word riotous there means uncontrolled behavior. He lived for his flesh. A life of selfishness, fulfilling the desires of his flesh. He did whatever he wanted to do. And the Bible says that he wasted all that he had. Not only did he waste but also the Bible says he wanted. You see, there's a problem with living for our flesh. And that is it doesn't satisfy. It doesn't meet the need. He had been given everything. He had been given everything and he had given it all to the world. And yet the Bible says the world had chewed him up and spit him out. In verse number 14, the Bible says he began to be in want. A, a mighty famine had, had crippled the land and this young man became uh, in great need. And friend, listen to me. When we decide to separate ourselves from the will of the Father, then the outcome is that we're going to be in great need. Our needs will not be met and we will not be satisfied. So many people today in our world try religion to satisfy that place in their heart that only God can fill. They try religion and they try to fill their life up with busyness, doing this and doing that. And they try to fill their life up with this thing or maybe someone or something. And they're always trying to fill their life, that void, that emptiness in their life. And yet, listen, the outcome is always the same. They're in want. and They're empty. And nothing fills that void. And so the Bible says here that he wasted and he wanted. And then we notice that this young man, he wandered. Where does this young man end up? Well, listen, when you follow your flesh, who knows where it will take you? You see, for this young man, he ends up in a pig pen. The most degrading occupation for anyone, especially for a Jew. The Gospel of Luke teaches us in this passage of Scripture that here he had wandered from the Father and he ended up in a, in a pig pen and, and he soon ran through the money and he finished up his life here feeding the pigs. Someone said it was forbidden to a Jew because it was said, cursed is he who feeds the swine. And yet, the reality is without God, we could end up anywhere. It is but by the grace of God that we are here this morning. That we are not in the pig pen of this world. 
God's grace is wonderful and God's been good to each of us. Prone to wander, the hymn writer said, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We see the Bible says that he wasted and he wanted and he wandered, but also in verse 16, notice this, he wished. He wished. In verse 16, this young man pauses for a moment and he takes a long look at his life. He, he, look, he, he looked at where he had come from. He, he looked at where he was. And his desire was simple. I wish I could be satisfied. Again, the hymn writer said, feeding on the husks around me till my strength was almost gone. Long my soul for something better, only still to hunger on. Hallelujah, I have found Him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings. Through His life I now am saved. Do you know how low this young man was? He was so low that his desire was for someone just to feed him the husks that the pigs ate. His desire was a good meal, and that good meal was the same meal the pigs were eating. That's how low that this young man had come. He just wished someone cared for him. He just wished someone loved him. He just wished that, that someone would direct him. God bless a godly father that teaches their children in the way that he should go. You say, well, if I, if I give my, my children Bible principles and I, I, I give my, my children the pathway and say yes and say no, then they're going to hate me. Listen, in the heart of a child, they want direction. They want that help in their life. And he wished that someone would provide for him. The Bible says he would fain. It means to, to will deliberately or to wish or to desire, to be minded. He, he would feign his desire that, that someone would give to him. That, that someone would give to him. And, and the verb here is imperfect active. It's a continual state. The Bible says that his longing continued day after day after day after day. He just wanted someone to love him. Someone to care about him. Someone to help him. And yet the Bible says no one cared to give to him. No one loved him. Don't believe the lie of the devil. The devil will, will say, oh, I care about you. Come my way. I'll show you a good time. The devil doesn't care about you. They didn't care enough to even give him the food from a pig. We see his desire. Not only do we notice in this passage of Scripture this young man and we notice in his life his rebellion, but I want you to notice secondly the son's reality. Now there's a wonderful thought here in verse 15. The Bible says that he came to himself. And that's a wonderful expression in our Bible. This young man was as far from himself as he was from his home. And the Bible says that he, he came to himself. He started to see his reality. He was away from his father. He was beaten down by a sinful life. He was empty. He was hungry. He was lonely. And he started to see the reality of his state. We see, first of all, his reasoning. He thinks to himself, you know what? Even my father's hired servants have bread enough to eat. The thought there, bread enough, means that they were flooded with bread. They had more than enough. In the lowest in his father's house, their needs were being met. Not only do we notice his reasoning, but we also notice this man's repentance. 
The Bible says in his heart, he decides to arise and to go. We notice the act of the will here after he comes to himself, after he realizes his reality, he realizes his sinful condition. And repentance is just the change of our mind. The Greek word means to to think differently. And here he started to think correctly, to, to think within his reality. He says, listen, I did sin. Sin here means to miss the mark. And oh, did he miss the mark in his life. But all of us miss the mark. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We see in this repentance, he said, I'm going back to the Father's house. You know, the best decision that you can make if you're a Christian today and you've strayed away from the Lord, you're, you're living in the pig pen of this world and you've decided to do it your own self and to live for your flesh. Listen to me. The best decision that you can make is to return to the Father's house. Is to come home. And here we find in his heart, he says, I'm going to return to the, to the Father's house. We see his reproach in verse number 19. He says, wait a minute, I'm no longer worthy. I, I think the greatest hurdle for someone who strayed from the Lord when they think about returning to the Father's house is to think in their heart, I'm not worthy to go back. Friend, we're all unworthy when it comes to the mercy of God. And the Bible says he has this humble view of himself. Even the hired servants in his father's house are above me. I am not worthy. We, we see the humility in his, in his mindset of returning to the, to the father's house. We see the son's rebellion. We see the son's reality. But I love this. Thirdly, notice the father's response. In verse 20, the Bible says, and he arose and came to his father. That's a wonderful thought. He came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I think we have a wonderful picture here of God and how He receives sinners. A wonderful picture of our, our Heavenly Father. You see, the Father was longing for His Son to return. He was looking for His Son to return. I'm not reading in the Scripture, but I believe that that father, every single day, he would look down that laneway and he would see if his son's coming home today. No, not today. He'd go about his business and then he would return to that laneway and look back down. Is my son coming home today? No, not today. And the day that that boy was walking up that pathway, I mean, he was flooded with joy. He couldn't contain himself. The Bible says that when his son was afar off, he ran toward him. You see, while the son was longing for satisfaction, the father was longing for his son's restoration. And that was his heart. The heart of the father. We see the father's compassion. The Bible says he runs to his son. It, it shows joy. It, it shows excitement. There's no doubt that his son was in bad shape. I mean, he was feeding the pigs. He was stink. His clothes were rat were rags. I mean, he was he was in bad shape. And yet, it didn't matter to the father. The Bible says he ran to him and he kissed him. He loved on him. He showed him compassion. The Bible says in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. God's compassion is new every morning. When you woke up this morning, 
God's compassion refreshed as we begin the day. I'm thankful that God's compassions fail not. And I'm, I'm thankful for the love and the compassion of, of the Father. Listen, the Father didn't lecture him. The Father didn't say, Son, before you come into my house, we're going to have to have a, a conversation. He, he didn't say, Boy, listen, I told you so. I told you if you went down that pathway. I told you if you took that inheritance, you would wreck your life. He didn't say that. The Bible says he didn't cast him away. But he kissed him. And he fell on his neck. He embraced him. He accepted him. He loved him. He rejoiced at his return. We notice not only the, the father's compassion, but notice the son's confession. And, and so I, I think if you can imagine this in your mind's eye, here's a young man returning to the father's house, and the whole way he's thinking, this is what I'm going to say to my father. This is what I'm going to say to my father. When I get to my father, when I see my father, he's going to be angry, and he's going to be angry, but I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this. He had rehearsed it over and over and over again. And as soon as his father saw him, he come. He comes running up to him. And, and here we see the son's confession in this passage of Scripture. He says, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you, and I am not worthy to be called your son. And he couldn't even get all the words out before his son his, or his father said, son, that's enough of that. He, he called for the hired servants to come. And I love what the Bible says in verse 22. It uses that conjunction there, but it's, it's a conjunction that makes a difference. It, it really does change the course of our life. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, we were lost and undone. We were separated from God, but God, it changes the course of our life. And here in this passage of Scripture, the Father embraces His Son. We see the father's conclusion in verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. The rejoicing of the father. The robe speaks of royalty. The ring speaks of the fact that he was a part of the family. The shoes speak that they were free. He, he was not a part of the servants. He was his son. And he said, let's be merry. Let us rejoice because my son was dead. And now he is alive. He was lost. But now he's found. I really do believe it reveals for us the heart of God in salvation. The angels rejoice when a sinner comes to the Lord. The Bible says there's, there's joy in the presence of the angels. Well, who's in the presence of the angels? God rejoices when a sinner comes to Him. But we cannot end this story without the other brother's condemnation. You see, the other brother, he was working in the field. And he was faithfully working in the field. He heard the music. He heard the celebrations. And so he approaches the home and he says to one of the servants, Hey, what's going on? And they said, Well, your brother's come home. Well, that other brother wasn't really in a mood to party. He wouldn't even go in. The father comes outside and says, son, what's wrong? He says, dad, I don't understand. I have faithfully served you. I have not sinned against you. I, I have not left you. And yet you didn't throw me a party. You haven't given me the fatted calf that I can gather all my friends together and, and we can be merry and celebrate. And the father said, 
look at this. He said, boy, you are ever with me. He said, the reality is all that I own is thine. Now notice there the consequences of sin. Because the boy, younger, had spent his inheritance. Listen, we can be saved and God can save us by his grace, but sin still leaves scars. The Bible says here, the father said, boy, he said, all I have is thine. But don't you understand that your younger, my younger son, your younger brother, he was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and is now found. By the way, there's no doubt about it that he's talking to the Pharisees there (laughs) because they were complaining that Jesus was eating with sinners. God help us never, never to lose the excitement when someone gets saved. God help us never to lose that excitement when someone comes to the Lord and and comes to the Father for that salvation. It's a blessing to know our Heavenly Father is a loving God. It's a blessing to know that He longs for us to come to Him. And if you're a Christian today that has gotten away from the Lord, then He wants you to come home today. And He will meet you with compassion and love. He wants to restore you and help you and to restore that fellowship. Friend, today, if you're not a Christian and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then God wants you to be saved today. You see, the Father, He sent His Son so that you could have eternal life. And he loves you and died for you. And yeah, I get it. We are not worthy. But his grace has washed our sins away. And we can have eternal life. I see the son's rebellion, the son's reality. I love the father's response. Fathers, God help us to be people of compassion. God help us today to to love our children, to guide our children, to direct our children. And yeah, they're going to make mistakes. Yeah, they're going to make wrong turns. But God help us to be compassionate and loving toward them. God help us to honor the Lord in all that we do. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word.